All right, this is chicken tissue that was put in for um, oh, six months or so in um, sandy soils with electrical currents, um, which is what, and wet, it's totally wet. And that is the nature of mud fossils. It was, uh, try, I tried to get as little oxygen in there as possible, uh, and which is what happens in mud fossils. They get completely compacted and the electrical currents, which are natural in the ground called spontaneous potentials, end up driving oxygen into the skin. And the skin is heavily invested with silicon. Silicon is 50 times denser in the skin than it is in the rest of your tissues. Now, what happens is the oxygen in the water, H2O, O, O, ends up attaching to the silicon in the skin because the silicon is looking to become stable now that it's lost the touch with the, the living body and it attaches to the O2s so you have SI silicon O2 is the oxygen and they are mingled together by the telluric currents which is exactly like plating a cheap ring and the silicon of the skin becomes dense with silicon dioxide these little quartzites looking things, which is actually feldspars. And that's the nature of how blood, mud fossils are created. Now here's another shot of the um, mud fossilization process. Again, this is about six months. That would have been normal skin tissue, but it gets invaded, and that's the nature of it. And because it's in wet environments, the blood um, tubing is is in its own natural environment is wet so it, it it doesn't even know you're dead and the same thing with the fascia the fascia is supposed to protect everything and keep it separated from everything out in the wet environments it could be caustic it could be acidic it, that's what it does it's built from different collagens and keratins and keratins in the body and they the body knows what to mix where and how, how, and it coats every single fiber in your body with something that protects it. And they call it fascia. And the fascia is a very thin film that, that is, is a, a coating, a sheath of all of the different, literally, cells. All the way from the cells up to the fibers of every single tendon and muscle fiber is coated with fascia. And it's an extremely sophisticated, um, form that keeps your body literally together. All right, here's the tendons. When the tendons get in, and this is the same part of that chicken tissue, but this is the tendon part, and that is altogether different than, than fleshy tissues, because in the tendons, there is literally no fleshy tissue to speak of. There's a little bit of blood here and there, so you get some what they call kaolin clays. So what this ends up petrifying as, the chemical signature is Ca, which is calcium, CO3, which is the carbon and oxygen and so forth that attaches to this. And um, along with that is some minerals, um, magnesium and things, things like that. Some um, CaCO3 with some of the aluminum and silicates and so forth that, that are in your body. Now, what's in, and it's, it's literally limestone. Now, and in your body, it's limestone too. But it's in uh, these things are all in these little stripy fibers. You can't see them; they're so small. And they slide against each other, and they bend and everything. And they're made in little triangular plates. And I've seen these in a microscope. And that's what they're like Chinese finger traps. And that makes this thing be bendy. It can bend around and flex and do all the things it has to do. But it's strong as it can be. And there's very little give to this. There's only a couple of percentage that it can stretch. And it's made in a wavy pattern. That's the nature of tendons, and that's they, they're spring-loaded, literally. And this stuff does not deteriorate. And the earth is made of this stuff, literally made of it. And it, what it'll end up creating is called plagioclases and olivines. Um, the feldspar is the, the skin tissues and the bloody investments that, that um, iron oxides create. Uh, and then the silicon and so forth and it creates that mass of uh, different little colors and things with impurities and it's sand literally um, but the limestone that this creates will turn into blocks and stripes and straps and it's very very interesting looking and I have all of that documented as well
Uh, you saw my tend and, uh, that I did in, the, uh, in my shop, and, and that is selenite, which is exactly the same as the tendon that I showed you, only that's from, a, obviously, a gigantic creature. And this is also selenite, which is the tendinous fibers in their, in their um, form here. And, hold on a second. I have, uh, here it is right here, I have a piece of selenite that was sent to me that actually, amazingly, has the abrupt transition right in, in it. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not, but you can see that brown stuff in there, that, and, and there's almost like a straight across uh, a line of it. It's, it's a little hard to see, I'm sure you're not going to be able to see this, but... Uh, it, that is the mineralized part, and this right here is what's called the abrupt transition. It was from mineralized going this way, and from that way it, it turns into the raw tendinous material. So this direction would be, um, uh, I believe, towards the muscle. And that stuff inside is literally um, the blood and the minerals that, are, that mix together. And, and they are embedded inside there because that's what service the selenite um, in, in the t body tissue of some creature. Alright, now these are pretty much all the different types of tendons. And I see these all the time, are the bar strappy looking ones. And every, inside of these are these little tiny fibrils. Then you have the wavy ones, which are like in the abdomen and so forth. And then, um, and they all have this bloody investment sheath on them because they have to slide amongst that sheathing. And then you have these lacy looking patterns. And those lacy looking ones are seen in some very strange structures. Look at this very carefully. And I'm going to show you ones that um, I feel are the exact same thing. This, the red part is the blood. And the white part is the um, limestone um, calcified material. Now you just saw that lacy looking stuff and that's what I'm saying is the same stuff and that is the blood that invests in between and that is the lacy looking um, calcified stuff and, and they decided to carve this. They're all the same age and I believe they were all done uh, during the, um, the, the flood that, that killed off virtually everything on earth. And uh, this is a... All I want to do is have it examined. I could be totally wrong. This could be just rocks and dirt and who knows what. But I could be right too. And the, the DNA says I am right. And the chemistry says I am right. And the spectral analysis says I am right. Sandstone, that's the eroded silicon. You see SI silicon. It's in, in, in sandstone, but once it erodes off, the fleshy tissue of mudstone is, is no longer has the silicon. Same thing with limestone, the silicon is pretty much gone. But then they all take on the same structure, except back here again. Calcium, there's not a whole lot of calcium in sandstone because the calcium sits inside in the bone material. But mudstone and limestone, they're, they're virtually the same. And all of these chemicals are the same, except the calcium, because the calcium is in the mudstone and the limestone, because that's the internal part of the creature, but the calcium is not necessarily in the sandstone, which is the skin. So the spectral analysis is correct, the anatomy is correct, the DNA is correct, the CAT scans are correct. It's been um, been verified by one of the top anatomists in the world. He goes around doing um, uh, training on autopsies all around the world, Gil Headley. Uh, there is nothing here that can be disputed. It just has to be looked at, and that's all I'm asking for. And I've been refused by Yale and Harvard and every single other one of them, and not even one single academic or or so-called expert will respond to me because they can't, they can't dispute what I'm saying and they're embarrassed and, they, and they're, it's a death sentence for them to come out and say yeah this guy's right because they'll be destroyed by their peers. I want this thing looked at and that's what I expect to have happen. I expect somebody of importance, somebody that has some power, which I have none, to step forward and say look this isn't right. Which it isn't right and then there's not a person on the face of the planet can say this is a good thing. So I'd like to have it looked at. That's my my rub. Somebody please contact me and, and, and let's just make this thing happen.